G'day chaps and welcome back to Total War Thrones of Britannia. Welcome to my <laughs> mini 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 tiny tiny empire and it's not this one. So I am not England. Uh, as I mentioned kind of in my last video I was tempted to try one of the Viking Sea Kings. So I started basically just with this region up here. You see where my cursor is. Just that, and a few islands off the northwest of Scotland. And I've kind of expanded my empire. Maybe I can make this a little. There we go. So you see, I've taken over the north, the uh, the islands up there, taken over this big chunk, and I've started kind of encroaching on Ireland. But I've got a way to go. Um, it's a big map, by the way. That's the first thing. Um, so. Before I kind of get into stuff, uh, let me tell you why I'm making this video. It is because I have seen a bunch of mixed ratings on Steam. And okay, I'm not going to say I'm uniquely qualified to talk about Total War, but I have played every single Total War they ever made from the beginning. And I've loved pretty much all of them. And I've got thousands of hours in Total War, so I know them inside out. This one is different. And I can see why some people have made negative reviews on Steam, but at the same time, some of them have been a bit over the top. So I've seen some, you know, someone saying, for example, um, this is not Total War. I mean, uh, you know, what are you talking about? You know, Creative Re Assembly have released this, they fucking made it, it's their game. Of course it's Total War. If you don't like it, okay, go and fucking suck a lemon. You know? <laughs> but to say it's not Total War is just anyway. But is it good? Is it good or bad? Right now, I'm really liking it. This is going to be my main game for a while. I've uninstalled Warhammer 2, which I had like 800 hours in. I played shit tons of it. But, you know, there was nothing more for me to do. So to get a new Total War to kind of tide me over to Three Kingdoms in November, this is perfect. So I'm very, very happy. Plus I got it for free, so I'm not going to complain. But I know that a lot of you guys, it has a really high price tag right now. So with the mixed reviews on Steam, you're kind of going to be in two minds as to whether you actually want to buy this or not. I'm not going to make a recommendation either way, but what I am going to do is talk about how this game is different and kind of my take on it. And not just how it's different, but the implications of how it's different, meaning how does it actually play as a game? Because it is different. So let me take you into what's going on. So we're at the north of Ireland here. If you look in the top right there, you can see it's not very clear, but you can see there's this like, you can see where I'm moving around on the map. So I have three armies right now. I have my king. You can rely on us. This guy here, he's 47. So I did control his father. His father died. Let's see. If, there we go. I can show you. So Eric, I started with Eric. Um, he had one disloyal son who I killed, and two loyal sons. Oh no, one loyal son. Sorry, and one daughter. Someone may have died. Anyway, so Kettle took over. It was hard. Um, loyalty is a big thing in this game, and. Disloyal generals, it, it's a problem if you don't address it. And I'll get to how you address that in a minute. But I killed off six generals, maybe, and a few more. And now his son has come of age, came of age at 16. I gave him an army straight away. And that has allowed me to kind of work on his stats. So, you, you know, characters are a big thing in this game. You can improve them. Let me show you. You improve them in a very simple way. So you have you have these things down the side. Forget the names. What it does is it gives you different traits. So champion, for example, gives you more command. The scribe makes you a better governor. Um, and you have siege engineer. Priest is really important because that gives more loyalty. So again, loyalty is a big deal. The other thing which is new is in this screen here, estates. So, as the king, as you expand and you take more and more territory, 
these kind of get subdivided or divided into state uh, states. Now, it took me a while to kind of figure out that if you don't give your estates away, you have basically rebellious generals, uh, nobles, so they get really pissed off with you. Uh, now you can see my senior nobles are all 10 out of 10 loyalty, happy chaps. The younger guys, they're kind of coming of age, so they're coming up. They don't have any reason to be so loyal yet. I haven't really used them that much. They haven't been governing that long or commanding that long. And I haven't given them any estates. Whereas these guys at the top, these guys I've given away, I've given estates and you can see there who I've given it to. So this guy here at the top, he owns this one. So you're, you're, yeah, you're buying off the loyalty of your leading most important guys. Now when they die, I think those estates revert back to you. So you have to kind of, and then it's up to you who you divvy it out to. So this guy, for example, down the bottom, Vidar, loyalty three. If it gets any lower than three, it becomes a problem um, and they can rebel any moment. So with a loyalty of three, I could either give him an estate or I could fire him as a governor and then I could spawn him as a new general here. And it's dead easy to do. I've done this a few times now. You just spawn him as a new general here and he'll rebel. And then you just, in one turn, you just kill him off. So that kind of solves that. That's a very simple solution. I'm not sure if the designers actually thought of us to deal with it that way. But um, yeah, it's pretty easy to deal with as long as you have your kind of wits about you at the moment. Now, what is weird and new is that if you go to here, if you go to recruit a new general, it's basically like rolling the dice. So, you, you know, it's a pure lottery as to how loyal they're going to be and what kind of stats they have. So, as you can see here, I can't tell what these guys are going to be like. And this is kind of a problem because if you're in a pinch and you need to raise a new army, it's not that simple anymore. You can't just have a ton of cash and raise a 20 stack army. You just can't. There are also no recruitment buildings, though. So from day one, you get access to all unit types. So again, it's different. It's just different. Um, now, to stop the being kind of a... Well, to make recruitment kind of progression-based, I guess, let's put it that way, you do have different levels of unit. So as you research more technology... I'll just show you the tech tree. Where is it? Here we go. So you have military and you have civic, and these are split into different things. Now, some of them are locked in the beginning, and you have to do certain things before you can start to research them. So, for example, here, siege warfare. I, I need to win five siege battles before I can even begin researching that. So I need to win one more. I've won four out of five. And then, because I'm Vikings, obviously, I've focused very heavily on melee, because they are very, yeah, they're just melee heavy axe unit type fighters um, and I focused on a bit of money and leadership especially leadership you can see I'm trying to get more influence and more loyalty um, and down here I've focused on uh, oh here's another thing so public order is also an issue again very different um, so the, the biggest reason you're building buildings now is not so much to recruit forces that's just gone out the window it's more about uh, getting public order so for example let me show you something that is a different kind of scenario so here for example right at the top of my my little kingdom um, I had these mines here silver mine and a lead mine now these were basically too developed for the province now as you can see as as on the left here if you look on the left a level one lead mine gives you minus two public order you see the 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 red face there. If you develop that further, it gives you minus four public order. Now, a difference of two is actually quite a lot. You can see the the, the overall balance here is only four, um, and that kind of kind of fluctuate depending on what happens in the game with your king. So I actually had to downgrade one of the lead mines and take the loss of income just to make sure that this province here was stable. Again, so just very very different. Okay. What else have I got? Let me just look at my notes. Oh, food, of course. Um, this is food here. 285 abundant food. 
but this is only because this is quite late game. Well, not late game, but it's I've kind of developed and I've built up my kingdom. In the beginning, it was a real problem. So each unit takes 10 food. That's basically the equation you need to work on. Um, and as I've conquered more land, I've got more food. But in the beginning, because I started on these these islands at the top up here, I'll show you the top of the screen. So I started at the top here, top west, top left. And um, these are very bad lands. They're not very productive. So food was just a continual problem. I guess it would be different for England in the south. Food would be fine. So yeah, in my experiences, I've only played as the sea Viking kings. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the starting scenario you've you've you begin with, and it, it plays into the historical context because this is basically why the Vikings invaded. They had military power, and they wanted the nice, lush fields of England and Wales and and you know the lowlands of Scotland. So they came in and they took them, an island, of course. All right, so food is a big deal. Um, oh, another big difference. There's no forced march. Now, that might sound like a small thing, but it's not. It's been a fundamental part of Total War for forever. Um, and if you play as the Vikings, for example, you know, you're supposed to be able to go and raid. And you just, you can't really. It takes fucking forever to, to get anywhere. So let me just show you. It is a big map, like I said. So if we go strategic map, right? Here we go. So I'm in the... There's my army. That's the one I just selected. This is my king, Kettle. If I wanted to get down to... Let's just go somewhere reasonable. The south of Wales, for example. So that's not that far on the map. Just look. I take this general and I go down, 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 fucking down. Here. It takes that long to get down there. It's... it's turns and turns and turns and turns and turns. It takes ages. It's not like you can just get down to you know the south of England and raid and then get back home again. It, it's not. I guess I did read an interview about uh, with the uh, creative director of this game by the way and he said that they, they've changed all this to try and make it more um, true to the historical context and if you think about it this is kind of the way it would be. So the Vikings if they came down and they raided it's a long way, um, and I think this kind of plays into the the idea that they would come in and they would start to take bits of land here and there, rather than just come and grab some stuff and, and go home, because it was it was pretty far. And communications in these days, you know, you got to remember it's 900 AD. It's not that long after the fall of the Roman Empire. This is before the medieval, medi med Middle Ages, sorry, before the Dark Ages even. Okay. Oh, another huge thing is army growth. Uh, it's again, it's just a new concept. You can't, you can't just spawn a twenty-stack army. Um, I've got some spare cash. Well, I'll show you how it works. So we've got. We'll just choose someone at random. We go this guy. Okay, he has market, so we don't want him. Minus fifty percent upkeep cost for sword and axe infantry. Okay, perfect for a new general. So we'll raise him. And here we go, this is what I mean with the lottery. Right away we get a notification saying this guy is disloyal. There we go, loyalty one, which is shit. That's as bad as it gets. That, well, you can get zero, but only if you piss him off. So that means straight away we have to take him out of this element. We have to take an army and plant next to him because he's going to rebel straight away. And it's a weird little mechanic but you can kind of deal with it quite easily if you're prepared to waste a bit of money so I'll try recruiting the next guy let's have a look he's got a loyalty of two also shit so I'm just gonna leave him outside the settlement and if he rebels I'll kill him too and I'll try with this guy last guy loyalty of three okay I'll keep you so there we go there's the lottery that's how it works and then let's raise some troops so, I have plenty of money, plus 1300 per turn. It's about time I recruited a new army anyway. So I'm going to go for kind of cost effectiveness. Some of these units, as you can tell, are very expensive. $300 uh, gold is a lot, to give you some kind of context uh, 
archers cost 50 and they're upgraded archers so the cheaper archers cost 20 so here we go the cheapest unit is just 50 per turn um, so I'm gonna oh, they're not that cheap anymore all right so let's just go for these guys Eastern mailed axemen let's go one two three and take a couple of infantry I've got three infantry uh, archers sorry and let's go for some cheap axemen so this is going to be kind of my support army just kind of hanging in the background all right so there we go income's dropped a lot so you can see it really is quite expensive but as you can see down the bottom here they start in a very fragile state basically so out of 120 men I've only got 36 so what they're trying to replicate here is the idea that you you know in real life you would you wouldn't just have an army appear out of nowhere you would need to recruit them and then train them and kind of get them ready over a long time so what that does for gameplay is it means you need to think you really need to think you need to think ahead so for example I am I have these two big full stack armies down here in the north of Ireland and my next target is these guys Stratclude and they are allied to these guys also so I'm thinking of starting a war with this entire section of southern Scotland northern England and these guys are fairly powerful so I'm strength rank ranking three he's strength rank six and this guy his ally strength rank 11 so those guys together are probably comparable or maybe a bit stronger than me I'm gonna have a lot of armies to deal with so it makes sense that I have these two full stacks and they'll go in to, um, to attack but I'll also need someone here in the north of Ireland to kind of keep that safe and secure for me because nobody's friendly nobody likes me um, so like I said, that means you just need to plan. So I had all those spare resources of cash and uh, food. So I can raise, I'm going to basically raise almost a full army, maybe 14, 13. And they'll hang in the background and secure my flank as it were. And then those two stacks are going to push in. They'll just kind of dominate their way up. Uh, very briefly, another way the game is different is that you have these big settlements, the main settlements, like in the last few iterations, these guys. And they have garrisons and they have walls. But the two smaller settlements, or three smaller settlements, have nothing. Nothing at all. No garrison, no wall, nothing. So you just walk into them. Again, just different. Just very, very different. So, my plan. I'll take these two full stack armies. They'll cut their swathe up here. Sorry for the clicking of the mouse. And then up the top here, I'm going to need to build this army up as well. Because they will probably try to attack me up in here in the north. The good news is that they're dealing with rebels here by themselves. And it looks like... What's going on here? Ah, yeah, that's it. So um, other Vikings have uh, invaded. And the Scots here are pushing back. So they're kind of preoccupied. So it's actually a good time for me to invade. But it kind of it just illustrates the difference. You really, really need to plan ahead. All right, what else have I got? Oh, no trade agreements. Again, just weird, different. Uh, so these guys, for example, they are not particularly friendly. Relationship is deteriorating. So if I go and I offer a declaration of friendship, they find it insulting. They would never accept such a deal. However, we're already trading with them. And this is the weird thing. There are no trade agreements whatsoever. It's, it's just unusual. So you don't even need to think about trade. Everything, as you can see here, everything is just done automatically for you. Just different. Um, what else can I tell you? I think I've pretty much covered everything. Recruiting generals or governors is a risk. No trade agreements. It, you need peace to build up your forces. I'm reading my notes here. You need peace to build up your forces because... And it kind of creates this ebb and flow to the game. Where you attack and then you make peace and you build your armies and da 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 Another thing is war fervor. 
So you can't wait too long, because if you just hang around, people lose war fervor, basically. Uh, the appetite for war. Uh, I may have got this wrong, though. On higher difficulty settings, so I'm doing normal, though. You lose more war, f war fervor and for each war you are engaged in, so that means you want to have fewer, I guess. But you want to be winning them. So I've noticed it goes up when you're winning. Beyond that, I don't really understand it. Don't really understand what war fervor e equilibrium is or where it comes from. I don't get it. But I don't know. Um, yeah, so no force march. Vikings are slow to raid food, loyalty, estates, spawn and kill, generals, navy. Oh, final thing. My bad. No naval battles. Uh, sorry, there are naval battles. My mistake, sorry. Um, yeah, but they're not very enjoyable. That's the weird thing. So, uh, yeah, you can do naval battles. They are a thing. They seem to be very well generated. Uh, but I read another review by someone else and they said just skip them and they're very slow and cumbersome and I've just skipped them myself and auto resolved every naval battle so even though they have brought it back I would argue it's probably not a particularly enjoyable part of the game uh, yeah I'm gonna take a turn we'll see what happens and then I'll I'll sign off um, Thank you to the Patreon. I forget your name. I should look at it now. But um, yeah, you pledged five bucks to me uh, every month. And that's just lovely. Um, really, really nice message too. And I know I haven't responded to it in Success person. But is rewarded. here we are. I'm responding to it now. So I won't mention your name, but I just want to say thank you. Some people are uncomfortable if you mention them by name. But um, yeah, that was on the 4th of May, and I read your message, and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Uh, any money I make from YouTube, and it's not much, um, I just save in a PayPal account, and it goes on games, other games. So for example, uh, I'd like to have enough cash in that account that I can buy the Total War coming out in November. Um, and that's it. Any other equipment for the channel, I'll buy through that too. So for example... I'm still running on only 8 gigs of RAM because I lost one of my cards. And, um, yeah. I, I tried to separate the money from the house, so. Still running with 8 gigs of RAM. Yeah, so anyway, I appreciate your support. Your it really makes a difference. Okay. Um, I think that's it from me. Anything else uh, that I've missed, let me know in the comments. And, yeah. I'll see you in the next one. Ciao for now.